Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Schweitzer from the University of Arizona. I'm joined today by Dr. Milton Packer from Baylor University in Dallas and Dr. James Fang from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. We're here to discuss the announced late-breaking clinical trials in heart failure. Uh, there were six trials discussed today. And um, Milton, would you start us off by talking about the iron studies? There were two of them discussed today. There, there were, and, and there, it's really interesting. Uh, there is a hypothesis in the area of heart failure that um, some people with heart failure, some people are iron deficient. And some of the iron deficiency is manifest as anemia and some is not. So uh, perhaps if iron deficiency is, is really physiologically important that if you could give people iron, uh, then um, maybe their metabolism would be better, their hearts would work better, their skeletal muscles work, would work better. And uh, it's, it's a hypothesis that's really primarily developed in Europe uh, not so much in the United States, and so there are two clinical trials that are devoted to this. Uh, one is um, EFFECT uh, HF, which gave iron intravenously, um, and it, that is a, a, a way that uh, intravenous iron is, uh, has been given in, in the past with a compound called uh, ferric carboxymaltose. And it's been given in two previous trials uh, before, uh, both of which were blinded trials, which showed uh, an improvement in, in exercise tolerance and uh, an improvement in some symptoms and biomarkers. Um, Effect HF was actually an open label trial, uh, which uh, showed effects similar to what had been reported before in, in the fair HF and confirmed trials. Um, what was particularly interesting was the trial, I think, Iron Out. And in the Iron Out trial, the, that was a double blind trial. That was given, uh, iron was given orally. Uh, but there wasn't a big effect on, on iron uh, stores and, and markers of iron deficiency. Um, our iron doesn't really work that well. It isn't well tolerated and didn't have a whole lot of effect on of a, the symptoms of heart failure or exercise tolerance. So we're left with a, a, a sort of still interesting hypothesis that iron deficiency might be present in some people with, with heart failure. Uh, if we're going to um, address it, it's, it's probably going to have to be intravenously. And uh, we're probably going to have to see a big randomized trial of intravenous iron in people with heart failure to know what its major effects are, especially long term. And I assume you would blind that trial. Absolutely. <laughs> so Jim, I know you've thought about this a lot. So cause or effect? Oh, you mean the iron yeah. story here? <laughs> you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I really uh, feel there's enough evidence to support one side or another, mm -hmm. but to Milton's point, I think the issue really is to address the question is it's going to require a randomized prospective mm -hmm. trial. But to your question, one of the issues is, Milton, what kind of endpoints do you think would be a relevant endpoint to put together for such a randomized trial because mortality is unlikely to drive it? Well, it, it's going to have to be what we now have as the gold standard, which is cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. It's become our, our sort of banner uh, 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 endpoint. Um, it, it's a, it still requires a large number of patients. Um, it needs to be blinded. And uh, it, it's what we need to know because otherwise it's, it, mm. it's not what we're gonna do. But don't you think if people felt better, even if they didn't, as, you know, you wanna make sure they aren't dying or being hospitalized at a higher rate. But if hospitalizations and death were equivalent, but there was a clear signal that patients felt better uh, after iron infusion, don't you think that would be worthwhile? I, I think it would be worthwhile, but honestly, I think it would come out as a hospitalization reduction signal. Uh, I think a, a reduction in symptoms and a reduction in hospitalization is going to go hand in hand. Jim, would you agree? 
Yeah, uh, also I would love to get your thoughts about uh, biomarkers, adding, for example, NT pro BNP to a composite and whether that would just uh, dilute out that endpoint or be relevant to the total uh, value. Now it could be just driven by that and then of course people would you know, question so the, I, I, the I clinical utility. Yeah, I th that, that's the problem. The problem is if you add it as part of a sort of tripartite mm -hmm. um, endpoint, it, it's probably going to drive most of the endpoints because in most trials of cardiovascular mm -hmm. death and heart failure hospitalization, people actually don't experience the endpoint. So if you put N-terminal pro BNP in as a participatory mm -hmm. uh, biomarker, it will drive the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, excellent point. Yeah, well there are three, I believe, uh, randomized clinical trials of IV iron that are going to start or have started, and one of them's quite large, so right. I is think. Right, is blinded? Uh, Fair HF, I believe, is blinded. Fair HF2. Fair, Fair HF2, yes. correct, okay. yes. Well, let's turn, Jim, to the device trials that were announced today. There were two of them. Yeah, so the first one worth reviewing is the uh, LAPHF trial, which is thinking a little bit outside the box, but the whole idea is that exertional intolerance in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction is due to elevations in the uh, left atrial pressure. Uh, back into the pulmonary circulation, and this drives uh, arguably a lot of the exertional intolerance. We also know that the syndrome is very heterogeneous, so there are a lot of other things going on, but the idea here is that, well, let's lower left atrial pressure, uh, and the idea is to create a, uh, an ASD, essentially an atrial septal defect with a device. Interesting enough that uh, you can get away with this. It, it doesn't uh, always fit in my, my scope of thinking of creating holes in the heart. Uh, just physiologically seems to be a bit dangerous to do something God didn't <laughs> intend. But uh, you can do it. You can do it safely. Um, there were no reported um, morbid or mortal outcomes, I believe, with the procedure. And it did appear to um, lower exertional filling pressures um, in the subgroup or maybe in the entire group that it had it measured. Also, uh, not surprisingly, patients felt a little bit better. Of course, it was not uh, blinded uh, or randomized, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. But to my mind, although it may improve exertional tolerance, it doesn't get rid of one of the primary issues, which is the volume overload. So you're really just recirculating the same volume. And although the shunt was only about 30%, I think the QPQS was 1.3 um, over six months, 12 months, you, know, you really worry over years what that's gonna do. Right. Um, I think the average age was in the late 60s, mm -hmm. right? And <laughs> you know, uh, in modern uh, society, that's not old. So you wonder what that's gonna look like at 75 and 85. So, so the data presented today show that between six and 12 months, there seems to be no worsening of um, right-sided function, no worsening of volume overload. Um, so certainly in the midterm, it appears to be safe and, and the right side doesn't be t appear to be deteriorating. But I agree, the long-term that One of the problems that. when you uh, do one of these open-label trials is that there's a survival bias. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the people who show up at six months and 12 right. months are, are the people who've done well. Mm -hmm. So the you, one is always uh, sort of tempted to think about, well, what about the people who didn't show up? Because it's very easy to say the effect is sustained in people in whom it's sustained. Uh, so it, it's, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting. One has to be unbelievably impressed by the determination of interventional cardiologists to <laughs> fix holes when they're when they're present and create Pre holes <laughs> when they're not. Yeah. Well, and imagine if HEFPEF had an interventional solution, how it would change care of those patients. I, I you know, I <laughs> the the amount of creativity here is just <laughs> unbelievable. Well, to Milton's point about endpoints. So if, if, let's think right. just a couple of steps ahead to really take us <coughs> to it. You know, uh, do you think really this would decrease heart failure hospitalizations or affect cardiovascular mortality? Because if we're gonna use a, a mint point that's gonna be relevant, right? In, in all honesty, it, it actually doesn't matter what I think. It, it matters what they show. Uh, and although we can be enthusiastic or skeptical, yeah. 
um, they need to provide a, 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 the data in a controlled clinical trial yeah. that this actually is safe and effective. And uh, we may be, we, we may think, oh, this, God, this, I, this, this couldn't possibly work. But maybe it does. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we've seen the proof of principle, haven't we? Right. Well, we have actually have, have, have not seen very much. Uh, <laughs> we, well, we've right. seen an open label trial. Right? Yeah. But the randomized trial has started, so yeah. we will have one. Yeah. And then how about momentum? So momentum addresses a, uh, one of, I should say, several Achilles heels in the field of uh, mechanical circulatory support, or otherwise known as LVAD therapy, left ventricular assist devices. And at least with the uh, current generation of devices, one of the devices, the uh, HeartMate 2, has been fraught with well-publicized and published uh, incidences of um, uh, what we call bad thrombosis or clotting off of the machine. And this is incredibly morbid, um, associated with uh, high morbidity and mortality. And the reasons for these events are certainly a multitude. There are patient-related factors, there are device-related factors, uh, the anticoagulation regimen. It, it's a complex issue. And the idea here with engineering is that they came up with a better device, essentially a better LVAD. And how this is better is really with respect to two or three things. One, of course, is that the uh, centrifugal pump is a magnetically levitated device, so it's frictionless, so there is less heat generated, and it is thought heat, particularly at the friction points, becomes the nidus for thrombosis. And then two, it also provides an intermittent pulse by varying the uh, speed um, of the pump. And most of us, believe that the millennium that required to develop a pulsatile creature uh, is um, very important in changing that circulation uh, into a continuous flow one over time uh, has been fraught with problems, including clotting and uh, bleeding, which is what we see. So in Momentum, which is a trial of about 300 patients who are randomized uh, half to the HeartMate 2 device, which is the current standard of care, and then the other half to the uh, HeartMate 3 with a primary endpoint of survival free of disabling stroke or the need um, for either um, VAD replacement um, um, or explant um, was met um, in that they saw less uh, device thrombosis um, in the HeartMate 3 device. No differences in disabling stroke, which was good to hear. Um, and I think the numbers were relatively modest because it was a trial of only 300 people. I think there were 10 or 11 bad thromboses in mm -hmm. the HeartMate 2 and 0 or 1. Zero. Zero in the, um, in the HeartMate 3. The follow-up was, I believe, around a year. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the idea, of course, is this therapy is supposed to go Actually, on for it years. Actually, was a six months follow-up. Was it six months? And the tri trial's planned for two-year follow-up. So this was a pre-specified early look. Interim look, yeah. yeah. So you know, it's, it's encouraging, you know, right. certainly that engineering has, has really there helped. There were still, there were 15 GI bleeds in each arm, so it hasn't solved the problem of GI bleeding. Well, this is something we struggle with in, mm -hmm. in cardiovascular medicine, uh, no matter what the condition is, you right. know, either you're bleeding or you're clotting. <laughs> um, but the engineering ingenuity here is just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, it, it just, it really is, because they're, they've actually developed a pump that uh, doesn't become, doesn't get in contact with, with, with the blood right directly, at all. Right. which is, I mean, one would think that that would be a requirement for a pump, <laughs> and no, it's not. <coughs> Uh, it, it's really a remarkable technology, and it just, I think, represents how quickly, uh, when we think about developments in cardiovascular medicine, how quickly um, technology can move. I mean, all of us were present when the XVE was the standard mm -hmm. pump, mm -hmm. and, and you know, we're not here many years later right. to see the devices at this level. Uh, for example, TAVR, right? right? Uh, in the world of aortic stenosis. I mean, we're already studying low-risk risk. patients yeah. against a standard of 50 years of surgical AVR. I think the other important thing about the MOMENTUM trial was that previous uh, mechanical circulatory support trials have always been done in a population that was either being bridged to transplant or a population that was not eligible for transplant. In this trial, they took 
everyone with advanced heart failure, no matter where you were heading ultimately, and enrolled them all. Yeah. And um, I think this is important from a uh, policy and healthcare perspective because uh, pe people are having life and death decisions made now by payers based on where they're ultimately heading. And we can implant VADs in some patients and not in others. And they all have advanced heart failure. Yeah. And the data are clear that the quality of life and longevity improve if you select these patients properly. So I think Momentum has made a very wise choice to say that anyone who needs one of these pumps will do well no matter what their ultimate destination will be. Yeah, no, absolutely, point well taken. So there were two other trials. Um, shall we discuss Athena? Who would like to sure. take Athena? Well, yeah. Athena addresses one of the most difficult uh, topics in, in heart failure circles, and, and that is the problem of uh, heart failure hospitalizations, uh, and also go, goes by the moniker acute decompensated heart failure. And there's a, there's a very uh, vigorous debate about what is a heart failure hospitalization and what does it mean. And there are a lot of uh, views on that. Um, there, are those of, uh, there are those of us, like myself, who feel it really is just a marker for disease progression. There are others who feel that uh, it exacerbates the disease itself and contributes uh, to the progression of the disease itself. And that's an important point, because if you think about what interventions you're going to um, use to improve the morbidity or mortality of it, uh, it, it really decides whether or not you just decide if you're gonna address this from a neurohormonal perspective, which is a representation of the disease process getting worse, or it's a um, care process issue, to be honest with you. And so what they addressed is they, they wanted to pursue the neurohormonal pathway, that this was a, and we know heart failure is a disorder of neurohormonal rage. Certainly aldosterone secretion has been well documented and we know there are good uh, prospect of randomized trials in chronic heart failure that clearly show a white mortality benefit. So the idea here was to take high doses <coughs> of a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, spironolactone in this case, and randomized patients in a double-blind placebo um, uh, way to 100 milligrams of spironolactone um, versus placebo. And the um, endpoint, I believe, was, uh, was it weight loss or? It was BMP. BMP. BMP reduction is, a, is the primary endpoint. Surrogate measure of decongestion. And it did not meet uh, that endpoint. In fact, none of the endpoints uh, uh, met statistical no. significance. The Weight loss, look remarkably output. similar. Yeah. Of interest, though, was there was uh, no clinically relevant hyperkalemia. Right. Which I think is a very interesting point. And you know, I'd love Milton's perspective on the dose they tried. Well, it's interesting because um, we've always been in, in, in when uh, spironolactone was used as a diuretic and. It was used in the diuretic in doses actually greater than 100 milligrams. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it, it, it was a diuretic. It was a very slow-acting onset diuretic. And, to, uh, and, and of course, the doses that we use in HEFREC mm -hmm. are, are doses that are much lower than that. And doses that, even when they're lower, are associated with some meaningful risk of hyperkalemia, but of course, in a setting where they pro it actually provides benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, what you brought up in, in acute heart failure is just so interesting because um, I had the opportunity to present the results of True AHF a few days ago mm -hmm. where we actually gave a drug that lowered the N-terminal pro-BMP substantially for 48 hours and <coughs> decreased intravascular congestion and decreased uh, in hospital worsening heart failure events. And had no effect on subsequent hospitalization and uh, cardiovascular death. I agree with you. I, I think uh, acute decompensation is a marker of progression as opposed to an accelerator of, of progression. Mm. Yeah. I think there are a couple of things. One is that, you, that, you know, there's evidence of uh, uh, diuretic resistant patients having an aldosterone escape phenomenon and very high aldosterone levels. And so I think in part this trial is designed to address that, the problem was they didn't choose a diuretic resistant population. They mm -hmm. took all comers. So the question remains, I think, if you have a truly diuretic resistant patient, whether 
high doses of aldosterone, and I would agree that 100 may not be high enough if you have yeah. true uh, diuretic resistance. Well, one of the examples of that that we don't see that much anymore as cardiologists are the uh, patients with ascites. Mm -hmm. So an example of mm -hmm. massive uh, neurohormonal activation creating significant uh, volume overload. And in those patients, it is routine for hepatologists right. to have patients with ascites on 200 milligrams of spironolactone. Right. Or 400. 400. Exactly, right. so <laughs> right. without question and without hyperkalemia. Right. So. Who knows, maybe it was a dose issue. Well, I also think if you look at um, the two arms of this trial, they were diuresed extremely aggressively. The average weight loss was seven pounds um, over f three or four days, which is higher than any other trial, even though we would say often we do more than that. But that's driving the potassium down, right? Because that's happening with Lasix. So I think it is a population at lower risk for hyperkalemia too. Yeah. Well, you know, my perspective is that heart failure hospitalizations, you know, because, you know, Greg Fonero and his card analysis, right, showed BUN, right. Mm -hmm. drives a lot of it. Well, that's simply a chemistry panel evidence of neurohormonal activation out of control, right, because of the clearance of BUN is determined by your neurohormonal profile. Also, you could view, because 90% of heart failure hospitalizations are driven by salt and water overload, you could view that as simply neurohormonal escape, couldn't you? So, but but Jim's original point is is exactly right. I mean, do we 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 do we really think that um, a heart failure hospitalization is the driver of of the disease, or is it a marker right. of worsening disease? Um, the the efforts that we put into trying to uh, treat or aggressively treat people who are two days, three days, four days, and think that that's going to make a major long-term impact, it, it's so much more important what we do as an outpatient yeah, right. than what we do as an inpatient. Right. So uh, the final trial uh, presented in this session is the Multisense trial, which was a trial of uh, um, sponsored by Boston Scientific using device diagnostics available in their CRT device to explore whether one can use that platform to predict heart failure events. And this was an interesting trial. The device uh, was monitoring things such as heart sounds. You could hear an F3 with the device, uh, heart rate, of course, um, activity of the patient, thoracic impedance, and um, using a proprietary scoring system uh, coming up with a score. And the, the point of this trial was to see whether there would be a score that was sufficiently sensitive for an upcoming heart failure event um, without having a lot of false alarms to a patient. And the entire trial was done behind the scenes. The patients had these devices programmed to turn on this um, uh, equation, and then they were just tracked. The doctors didn't have access to the equation, and they did this first in a diagnostic cohort uh, to determine what they thought was the right score from the programming. And then they did a test cohort where they said, did the score we got in the diagnostic cohort work? Again, the doctors didn't know anything. And they did, in fact, find a score that uh, predicted heart failure events. Um, the the uh, change in this score occurred on average 30 days prior to the hospitalization. Uh, and, uh, and it held up in the validation cohort. Um, the, and I think the most interesting thing is that if you look at the patients who had events compared to those who never had an event by this score, um, they look very different. The people who had events, the minute you turn this program on, are high risk. And then they become higher risk prior to being hospitalized. But they're a different, they look differently by this diagnostic algorithm. So it's interesting and obviously the next um, st step is going to be um, seeing whether we can act on that information to change the natural history. It's, it's so amazing how uh, we are asking for biomarkers that we can react to. Uh, actually, there, there are lots and lots of things that we can do to prevent hospitalizations in the long term um, with existing drugs mm -hmm. that, frankly speaking, a lot of physicians don't utilize. And, and certainly don't utilize necessarily at the appropriate dose. So um, I, I would be very impressed by the additional information 
if, if we knew that people were getting optimal medical therapy, but almost no one gets optimal <laughs> medical therapy. Yeah, I would agree. I think the, our efforts really should not be on more diagnostics. Right. It, well, it's more the paradigm of treatment that we have to change people's minds with. Mm -hmm. Because it would be one thing to have symptoms and hospitalizations and mortality on optimally treated patients. But it's another whole can of worms when we're just talking about figuring out who's going to get into trouble, but they're not even optimal. Right. Uh, it, it's sort of similar to, um, do you want to invest in um, a structure that has met fire codes, or do you want to invest in a fire alarm? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and frankly speaking, I'd, I'd rather build a building that uh, obeyed the fire codes yep. and was uh, fire resistant rather than invest in a very fancy fire alarm. Yeah, absolutely. And well, this very fancy fire alarm is only present at about 1% of heart failure people, patients right now. Well, even more interesting is, do you either one of you want to comment on uh, the suspension of Guided, which is the uh, probably the last attempt to use, uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Packer has written about this, about <laughs> the attempt to use uh, uh, biomarkers to guide therapy. Apparently it was suspended a few weeks ago for futility, I believe. Mm -hmm. It was NIH sponsored. And, and that's correct. And, and what's so interesting, again, is it, 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 we have been looking for what, what I would call perhaps medical crutches uh, to walk on, uh, something that would remind us to do the right thing, something that would remind us to use uh, the, the right drugs at the right doses. And the, the fact is, we, we probably have to remember to do that without the medical crutches, because uh, the, the medical crutches, one, aren't there, two, aren't reliable, and three, the data we have that the drugs work don't depend on those medical mm -hmm. crutches. So we, we just have to learn how to do the right thing. <laughs> well said, well said. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you. We're done. Thank you.